welcome. That's the first thing to do is like, I, I looked and said, say welcome to everybody. <laughs> okay, so welcome, welcome to UT. Everybody made it from wherever you're coming from. And we're gonna start, it says introduction and welcome, but I'm actually gonna flip it around. First the welcome, I've already said welcome, and then the introduction, you're gonna introduce yourselves, and I've noticed you're already chatting amongst yourselves, so I broke people up into tables because otherwise you were in these, these you know, rows, and we're not gonna do it like that this year. We're gonna make sure that you have, you're working in small groups, and this facilitates it. It's a lot easier to move around. So if you think this is my table, it, no, it's not. It's not your table. It's our table. You're going to move around. <laughs> um, you'll do a lot of peer review, and we'll, we'll make sure that this is more of an animated workshop. And it's a workshop because you're going to produce something. There are deliverables here. You're going to work. We're going to get you to work. But so let's start off. Um, next slide, please. Let's start off with a real quick introduction around uh, we're not going to go through and everybody stand up. We'll, by the end of all this workshop, you'll be able to, you'll know who we, all the different people here. But let's just talk about, uh, where, uh, introduce yourself to your table mates, your name, your affiliation, if you have an institution, languages, interest. Really quick, though, I'm going to give you a minute per person, so boom, boom, boom. And here's a big word, your hopes and ex your dreams and expectations <laughs> for this, this workshop. What are you bringing here? Uh, usually when expectations aren't met, people get grumpy. So it's kind of good for me to figure out, okay, what's on your radar as you come here? What do you think is going to happen? What are your expectations? And then um, real quickly, since you're language teachers and you know how to do this, this is a small group activity, I'm going to ask one person from the table, okay, who are these people? And some of you tables you are, are kind of anemic. There are only two people there. You might want to find another table, okay, that would facilitate it, yeah? So like four is a good group. Those two people, yeah, that's a table. Okay, so on your mark, get set, go. Okay, that's good enough, that's good enough. You know some, you know your table mates a little bit now, that's, that's all I want. This is called an icebreaker. You, you've already broken the ice. Um, excuse me, I'm, I'm eating, I'm eating my breakfast taco. Welcome to Texas. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do is ask, you know how we do this. We have, have a, a, a spokesperson from your table. So instead of like having going around the table and introducing everybody, how about let's just do this. What were some of the answers to this hopes and expectations? I'm really interested in that. And Corey's like, what? I don't remember what people I, I said. Didn't oh, you didn't get to that? <laughs> Um, I told you to move along fast. We, okay, you have one minute to do that quickly. So um, let me start. Chantel, you were at this table. I was. Can, do you remember what some of their hopes and expectations were? And can you, so just a note, oh, yeah. I'm going to be passing around a mic the whole time because we're recording this, so this is just to not to amplify your voices, but just to record. <laughs> okay, yes. All right, you're going to tell me if I get it wrong, right? You're going to, okay, give me kind of a signal. Um, some of their hopes and expectations, which I think will become relevant tomorrow as well, were about professional aspirations. So they're all um, working on or hoping to work on soon PhDs, and this ties in potentially to some of the work that they'll be doing in those. Yeah. That's good because some of these expectations will get met. We'll try really hard to meet that one. This is very much about professional development, getting something to put on the CV, thinking about your professional trajectory, all of that's good stuff. Um, Jenica, what did you guys talk about? Oh, oh, oh. oh. See, I know. I'm a sports person. You, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, this table, it was also very professional, but it was, um, we had kind of a mixed bag of people who have um, taught before and who have taught in different types of scenarios. And so everybody, I think, is pretty excited uh, to kind of add some, add some new things to their arsenal of, of things that they can integrate into their own teaching. So. Good. Yeah, we'll be, I mean, flight is very flexible. You can use it just about, it's a Land Rover. You can drive it across any terrain. Um, Corey, now have you yeah. figured out the answers? Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> you got something to say. <laughs> we do have something to say. 
<laughs> yeah. It, um, so personally, I found it really challenging to find texts yep. that would work um, to, to fit the flight model. And so one of the, the hopes that I have with this workshop is to have um, some, some better ideas and strategies for text selection, and especially for texts that may not necessarily look on the surface like they're literary, right, or creative. Um, right. So, and, and a lot of that is um, video, for example. So that's, that's one of the, the sort of goals Great. that I have. That will be definitely, we'll, we'll be talking about the literary and the everyday and how to find texts that really make that concrete. Mandy, you had a bunch of people and they were standing up too. We head up and moved you around. Had a mixer. We followed the directions. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we, um, I think we had some diverse hopes and expectations within our group. Um, uh, some of us were very unfamiliar, right, with flight and uh, even just all the acronyms that get, you know, get thrown into what we do. And so just really starting to understand what that is and how we can apply it to our contexts. And, and then I will say I was just really looking forward to kind of getting my hands dirty, as I said. It's been a while since I've really been involved with, like, actually creating lessons. Um, that, so I'm excited for that. Good. We will meet that expectation. Alessandra. Who are these people? What were their expectations? Um, well, this is Maggie, this is Liz, and this is Sarah. <laughs> and um, where um, our interests were, it was curriculum development as well, was also literacy-based OER, and also looking at um, peer review and feedback. Bing, bing, bing. OK, good. Uh, Molly. Yes. I'm not from uh, UT Austin, unlike a lot of people here, but um, what we talked about... Most people are not from UT Austin here, okay. by the way. Oh, no, 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 no. We're from all over. Oh, you yeah. just knew people... So I'm from UT time. Austin, but these people okay. are from all over. Great. We just talked a little bit about incorporating the appro uh, this approach into um, teaching, and different people are along at a different point in the continuum. Just some people learning more about it, other people getting back into teaching, um, looking at what other people are doing with it. And I've been doing a version of this, I guess you could say, but now I want to flesh it out a lot more. And um, I can put names to things. So, Great. yeah, so it's just about using it in our everyday lives. People are at different points, and that's okay. Don't worry about that. Uh, Chantel, this was your table, right? You were talking, yeah? yeah. And then you guys are with the, yeah. All right, that's everybody. Um, so I want to tell really quickly, because I just have a couple minutes here, that there's a story behind how flight really developed, and I have my props here. These, uh, the literary and the everyday was a kind of a concept that Joanna and, Joanna and Chantel, they were my two presenters, so Carl, Joanna, and Chantel, you know, we'll just use first names here, don't worry about last names. Um, she was really hoping, she was using another OER. OER simply means an educational material that carries an open license. We'll be talking about open licenses because open licenses set your ideas free. We want to be able to share ideas because good ideas magically lead to new ideas and it keeps on going. So ideas produce ideas, produce ideas. It's called semiosis. It just keeps on going, meaning making. But there's a problem with copyright, which locks things down. So we want to unlock that and create this infrastructure for sharing materials and really sharing ideas. That's OER, okay? So we, we created here many years ago a, a textbook, a curriculum. We made it free and available for everybody. And people started adopting it and using it as they would. Uh, and she discovered that there weren't a lot of what she felt were text that promoted the kind of literary dimensions that she was looking for and textual analysis that she wanted to bring into the classroom. She said to me that she, she called me up and said, can I add on to this? I said, of course, it's an OER. You're free to do that. I'd love it. And so while we have a lot of readings, they're kind of more journalistic in orientation. And she then had this vision of with each chapter extending it and having something along the lines of the literary and the everyday. So she ran with that concept, and we'll be talking a lot about that concept. What is this in interesting intersection of literary text, not necessarily canonical text, not even what we would consider literature, but something that has a literariness about it, that extends some kind of, of, of a rule in an interesting way, but is found in everyday language, which is then easy for beginners. 
because what we're trying to do, essentially what she was trying to do, is take the bifurcated model of lower division and upper vision and blend them together so that people can actually start to analyze text, that's what it's all about, from the very beginning to the very end, because that's what we do as humanists. We study text, and that's what we do as language users. Language is a text, and we make meaning with text. So that's the, the big ideas. And it became concrete. She produced this, what looks like a textbook, but we're calling it an OER. Um, it comes in a, as a Google Doc, so you can download everything. You can change the order. You can rearrange the activities and so forth, OK? Um, that's in French, so yeah, you, that's the whole, that was the, it started with French, but of course it's a great idea that can be borrowed into any language. So it's a fully open textbook, as I said, it, it, it is available online at lulu.com and you can, you can buy it, $20, or you can have it for free and in the digital form in Google Docs, because most people know how to play around with a Google Doc. Um, so we're also, some of you said for your expectations and hopes, you're framing it in terms of, of professional development. So we're talking about creating materials, and we want to privilege that. We want to make sure that people get credit for that. In, in education, we give something called attribution. That's very important. We want citations and so forth. And you want to work on something, but you want to get value from that work. So a lot of times, textbook publishing doesn't count a lot in the sphere of, of academics. We think of journal articles, or we think of books, monographs, but it takes a certain level of expert, uh, expertise to write a textbook. People who've tried and think it's easy discover it's not that easy. And so we wanted to make sure that we're creating this kind of infrastructure to give people credit and actually to promote the value of, of this enterprise because it is a, an academic, intellectual, professional enterprise. So that's also part of flight. We'll be talking about that. Uh, Open Textbook Library, which is a really great um, organization. It's uh, headquartered in, in Minnesota, at the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities. Um, there are lots of textbooks, open textbooks, that people are, are wanting to adopt, but they don't know about the quality. So if you go here, let's see. Um, Here we are now on the internet. If I type in French, if you're looking for a textbook in French, oh, well, Francien Tactif, I just showed you that. Um, and by the way, this is not a perfect search engine because I don't know what introduction of probability is doing in that list. Interesting, interesting. But OK, we have the literary and the uh, quotidien. That's the literary and the everyday. Importantly here, now, we have an infrastructure, not only for finding it, but there are reviews. So we have Nathan Rabelais. Well, that's a great name for a French professor, by the way. <laughs> College of William & Mary, he's an assistant professor. He reviewed the textbook. Um, and I'm not going to read all of these, but you can see that there's kind of a, an organization here. They ask them to rate it according to these various criteria. This starts to look like a legitimate enterprise, because it is. Uh, and this is something that people can put on their resume and be proud of and that kind of thing. So professional organizations have a way of showing their value and this is what we're trying to work with other organizations to get to lend legitimacy to what we're doing. So at the end of this project, we hope that you will be on your way to publishing something and that could be a line on your CV. Okay, so in addition to um, this great organization uh, called the Open Remember, remember this, Open Textbook Library. We'll be talking about a lot of repositories, places to find open materials. Um, we have this thing, which is our website for this project, and it's been going on now for a couple of years. I wanted to draw your attention to, if you go to the How To button here, at the bottom, it's Flight Resources. Click on Flight Resources, and we have the workshops. And this is this year, 2018, Teaching by Design. Everything that we're going to be using, all the handouts, everything are, is right there. So when you go back to your institutions and you want to share these great ideas with your colleagues, take them to this, OK? So everything that we will be giving you throughout the next two days, you can find right here, the documents. OK. Um, I don't 
want to step, I'm already five minutes over time, and I want to make sure that uh, Joanna has lots of, uh, uh, of time. Um, you got time? OK. Um, I want to then, so since I have a little bit of time, I want to show you some of the things that make, I think, that are the important components b b uh, of the flight project. And I was talking about legitimacy and taking kind of uh, an academic approach to materials production. Um, we have an editorial board, which is very important. And we've joined, joined forces also uh, this year and going forward with AAUSC, which is the American Association of University Supervisors and Coordinators of Foreign Language Programs. It's a ridiculous acronym. Um, essentially, you know, 300 uh, members who are people in charge of language programs throughout the country. So applied linguists, but the applied linguist is a pretty heterogeneous group. So people coming from literature or for linguistics or for culture studies. And what we're trying to do is have a group of editorial board members. So here are people, you'll recognize some names in French and in different languages who will review the lessons that people produce. Because it's not just creating a lesson and putting it on the internet. Um, that's not probably worthy of a line on your CV. Uh, people have all kinds of stuff on the internet. Fred's cheese page. Does Fred know anything about cheese? We don't know. So um, there is a process, an editorial process, uh, that we're going to explain. We'll, we'll call this the life cycle. The OE, it's actually called the OER life cycle. OER is a thing now. It stands for Open Educational Resources. Um, but there's a life cycle, and we want to show you that then the different stages along the life cycle, because your cool idea will then just lead to other cool ideas. Okay, but we want to then create these objects, these these lessons that will go into an archive hosted here at Flight, and then people then can take your object and then they just keep on going with it. Okay, that's the concept. But we don't want it full of junk. There are a lot of repositories out of out there full of junk, right? And so that's where um, uh, editorial board comes in. So when you get your lesson that comes out of this creative process and it's ready to go and you've taught with it, then you send it to, uh, you send it to us and we send it out for a review. Then it will be reviewed by professors around the country. They give you feedback. You incorporate the feedback. And then when we've decided it's ready to go, it gets published. So there is, and by the way, it's not a, a blind peer review process, which is typical in publications of academic, in academic journals. This is a community we're trying to create, so we don't want to be anonymous to each other. We want Kate Paisani at Carla at, at, at Minnesota to give you feedback and to know it's Kate, because you can then have a discussion with Kate. Um, you know, it's really great when you, when you get an, uh, 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 something that's that you've written a manuscript and then people have a lot of stuff to say, but sometimes you want to say something back to, the, to your reviewer. <laughs> you don't understand it or you disagree with it, and that's the negotiation. And this should be a, then a collaborative and collegial enterprise. So it's not quite, we're trying to take the best of different uh, frameworks, so the best of a peer review process. Okay. So that's flight in a nutshell. Um, I think you're going to get something out of this. Um, I'm not saying you're going to all be published because that depends on editorial review and that kind of thing. But we are setting the bar high, and we're doing that to say that this is worth this is worthwhile, basically. Okay. So let me turn things over to Joanna, and she'll then our first session of the day, and she'll she'll get right into the components of flight. All right. All right. So. First, I wanted to thank you all for coming. It's really a pleasure to have such a, a, a variety of interests and needs. And what's interesting, of course, anytime you put together a presentation or a workshop, you always ask yourself, who is my audience? And in this case, <laughs> wow, it's, 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 uh, it's quite a variety. So what's exciting then uh, is to be able to present this information. And I think all of you will find yourself, your place within uh, the work that, 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 that we're going to be sort of guiding you through. And um, from, you know, acronyms uh, down, you know, on that sort of level all the way up to uh, professional development for people who are language program directors, et cetera. So, um, so it's, it's, it's in some ways a lot of materials to cover. And at, and at the same time, uh, I think within this two-day time frame, we're going to be able to do it fairly elegantly. So this first session um, is called, and unfortunately the type 
font uh, sizes got all kind of screwed up on this. But anyway, it's called conceptualizing a flight lesson because it points to the, to, the, to the fact that before you can sit down and actually create or design a flight lesson, there's a lot of preparation that you need to do. And that preparation really centers on one element in particular. Anyone want to guess what that is? It's the literary. How are we defining the literary in this context? It's the literary, but for language acquisition. It's not for literary studies, specifically. Um, and it's, it's something that uh, can be found in the everyday. So f defining it, seeing how you can find it, and then using that for creating, making meaning out of a text, and which is going to be in the form of a textual analysis for flight, a flight textual analysis. So I'm going to be working, walk, walking you through, basically, these dimensions. It's, I'm going to really break it down, make it concrete. Um, and then Chantel, and then afterwards, you're going to have uh, the opportunity to work with text that you brought in. So first quick question, did, has everyone brought in at least one text? Is, is, is there anyone here who does not have a text? OK, so maybe what we can do when we get to that second session, um, you can work with someone who uh, works in your language and you can uh, maybe borrow one of their texts or, or use the same text. Or wave us down and we'll try, we'll find something that you can We'll find through. something. Yeah, it's not yeah. a problem, we can come up with texts. There are lots of texts out there in the world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, but, but the easiest thing might be to use something that someone already, uh, has already brought in, it's, it's right there. Um, so, um, all right, so actually what I'd like to do to begin is to start with a handout, which is a sample text. Now, you've done some preparation for this workshop, um, a little bit of reading, a little bit of looking at materials and at the flight website. I'm going to give you a text, and we're going to ask a very basic question. This is the text. And the question is, what makes this text literary? What dimensions of literariness, in whatever way you conceptualize that notion, what dimensions of literariness can you find in this text? So I'm going to give you about five minutes. You'll work uh, with the people at, at your group. You can work individually if you so choose, but you can also discuss. I'll give you about five minutes to see what you come up with. Yes. All right. How about we try now to bring it together? <laughs> um, OK, so what I'd like to do is to have each table just say one thing that you found. We'll go around to, so each table will have the opportunity to say one thing, listen carefully so that we, we don't, you don't repeat. And then after we've had that one round, if there are other things that you want to bring up, then let's bring those up as well. Okay. Can we begin with you? Yes. Um, well, yeah. Oh, and we need the microphone. Sorry. This is the... Thank you. Uh, one thing that we saw in this text is that there's... Um, there's room for interpretation from the reader, some sort of um, backstory or um, something that, um, you know, the not only the writer, but the, the reader fills in. Mm. That's a, an aspect of literariness. Yeah. Yes. Filling in the backstory. Whoops. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we noticed that there was a lot of playing with the reader's expectations. Like the first line asks, do you love me? You expect yes or no, not I could. Um, and also answering <laughs> questions with other questions. Um, yeah. yeah. OK. I, I can't remember if you were all one group. One of the things we talked about is it seemed like there's a little bit of genre play, right? Because it's a conversation, but it really feels like a poem. So something's mm. going on there. Mm. Feels like a poem. Uh, <laughs> first, it sounds like a, a, an everyday conversation, but when I read, like, I dialed, like, kind of over an instant messenger. Like, we don't speak like that on messengers. So we have, like, more of playing with words and expectations of the reader. So, for example, we say, do you love me? We, are, we expect, like, to be yes or no. But here I could. And then we have how much will it hurt if I tell you? So, like, using, with, using words and kind of puns and things like these. So you're tying in also with genre yeah, like play and playing with those expectations. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone? Whoops. So we also talked about genre play, but I also mentioned almost, I don't even know if this is a thing, but medium play. Ah. Um, because we said if this had been a screenshot, 
of the actual instant message, I would have read it completely differently. I would have put voices in my head of some teenage girl saying, do you love me? <laughs> um, so we talked about what the difference is between seeing it written like this, printed on a piece of paper, mm. as opposed to seeing an actual screenshot mm. of the conversation. Interesting. So your point about um, you don't know if there's a term for this. This is, we're gonna, you're going to encounter this very much when you start exploring the literary. And sometimes there is a term, a technical term, and sometimes there isn't, and that's okay. We don't need to be tied to terms. What we, need, what we want is to be able to work effectively with the dimensions, dimensions of literary, literariness that we want to bring to our students for language. Yeah. Um, we talked about how it is like a poem too and how there are some moments where it's ambiguous if it alternates um, between two people mm. or if it's just one person mm -hmm. and it could be like a self-reflection kind of thing. Uh, it doesn't have to be, I mean, it does say a dialogue conducted over instant messenger, but even there there's still like room for thinking that someone repeats a couple lines and then the second person responds. So it could be happening in someone's head, for example. Uh huh. Yeah. So context along with backstory. Yeah. There's also a lot of room for interpretation. Uh, what's the tone? We, we miss that. And so you, you can often look at this or you could look at this and say, you know, are they angry? Are they sad? Are mm. they? So what are the emotions behind uh, these lines? Um, and I think that that there's a lot to be interpreted um, here. I, you can also almost imagine uh, two actors coming at this and, and coming up with with various different interpretations right. of, right. of, of you know, is it rage? Is it is it sadness? All these different things. Mm. Yeah. Is there another element that you'd like to bring out that is different from what we've been discussing? Yeah. I thought it was interesting that if you just look at the text and you don't look at the the, the the instant messenger part, it could be from any time. It's a very timeless mm. way of speaking or writing. It could be from, you know, the 1800s, but then, and so you really have no idea. And then you see the instant messenger and it's kind of almost jarring. Right, exactly. So jarringness, uh, okay. All right, so as you can see, a simple text. Oh, uh, my other question actually was, if you were thinking of using this in the, an equivalent foreign language class in the language that you teach, what level would you want to work with this text in? And you can talk about it as semester level, um, if, at, at university level, since everyone here is. Could be A2 level, like from A1 to A2. Okay, A1, A2. We're dealing with yes, no questions and information questions. Right, information questions. Mm -hmm. I mean, it has to, you would have to, or the students would have to have learned. Um, oh, I'm of, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the students will have had to learn a lot of verb forms. So perhaps an intermediate level, we have future. We have a, like the hypothetical period that if I tell you, it will be true. So, um, you know, maybe this could be a second semester, but it kind of depends on the curriculum on you're the curriculum. working with. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. That'd be great. Okay. All right. So as you can see, it's a simple text. But there's a lot going on. It's everyday language, but all of these questions of interpretation, of context, et cetera, come into play. So what we're going to do now is we're going to start to unpack what we mean by the literary. And the first thing that I want to just cover is some of the basic tenets of flight. And of course, the acronym, me, me, mm, acronym means foreign languages and the literary in the everyday. So, one very important point is that communicative language teaching, CLT, scaffolds the study of literary meanings, uh, sorry, of literal meanings of language, and particularly at the lower levels. And this is a very stated um, assumption, objective. The idea is that you want to give students those basic building blocks, and that perhaps later, if students continue to more advanced levels, that they can get into um, these kind of potential nuances of language. But in flight, we widen the frame from just the literal to the literal and the literary from the beginning, as Carl was indicating earlier. So what's perhaps uh, 
uh, novel in this sense is that flight explores what structured input constitutes for the literary. And that's a very specific term within the field. So structured input, what, what are the mechanics, the basic, uh, 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 the functions, the, the, what, what is happening, right? What is the literary so that we can communicate that to students and not have it just be something that is entirely amorphous. So we want to, uh, to explore what structured input looks like in order to articulate a comprehensive pedagogy of meaning making and have it be for language, the purposes of language acquisition. Again, it's not for literary studies, it's for language acquisition. And finally, in line with other multiliteracies approaches, because flight falls under that much broader umbrella, flight reframes reading, viewing, and listening as interpreting and then writing and creating visuals as redesigning. So the literary, what does it mean? The opposite of literary is literal. So the literary in this context is all of the ways that a language and a languaculture, I'll get to that term in a moment, allow for creating non-literal meanings. So is anyone familiar with the term languaculture? So languaculture comes um, out of the field of linguistic anthropology. Um, Michael Agar is, is one of the key sort of uh, uh, people who has worked in this field. So the term, uh, his, uh, people use lingua culture. Um, Agar uh, coined the term lingua culture, but it's the understanding that a language includes not only grammar and vocabulary, but also what he says as past knowledge, local and cultural information, habits and behaviors. So language is not just a code, uh, you know, a, a um, code of forms, it embodies it in, in, in so many other dimensions of meaning. So in looking at the literary as non-literal, we're going to be talking about two aspects of this. And the first has to do with foregrounded meanings. So how many of you are familiar with the term foregrounded meanings, or is there someone who, this is entirely new, the notion of foregrounding? It's new. OK. So let's break it down. Foregrounding, and I'll, I'll just read through this, um, refers to the features of a text that stand out from their surroundings. The term itself is a metaphorical extension of the concept of foregrounding in the visual arts. So if you think of a painting, you have the foreground, the middle ground, the background. And depending on the visual prominence, we can ascribe, it's, it helps to ascribe meaning. It helps to create definition within that composition so that we can think uh, narratively, if we so choose, or think about uh, what that, even in, in a very abstract, in an abstract painting, we can start to construct uh, a sense of meaning. So foregrounding in a, visual, in a written text follows that same notion of prominence. So foregrounding theory suggests that in any text, some sounds, words, phrases, and or clauses may be so different from what's around them or from some perceived norm in the language you all talked about, oh, this is contrary to norm or expectation, that they are set into relief by this difference and made more prominent as a result. So why do we use foregrounding in a text? So there are different functions that we can ascribe to foregrounding. The first is to potentially highlight, soften, or intentionally obscure meaning, to express new or unique meaning, to differentiate or obscure perspectives, to invoke aesthetic and affective responses, to develop themes, and to create coherence in a text. So foregrounding, and we'll see by looking at these various examples, actually does a lot. And so if you think about communicative language teaching, teaching textbooks that only focus on literal meanings of language, how are students really supposed to be able to make sense of a text when all of these other dimensions that are actually in play are not being attended to? What are they getting out of meaning making that's going to be uh, allow them to then use that in the real world? So those are the functions, and there are many. And what's interesting, too, is that these so-called literary functions, when we use that term literary and we're try thinking of introductory level uh, language courses, we think too esoteric, not appropriate, right? We just want to give students the building blocks. So the flight approach is really about making the literary accessible to students and teachers. 
So what does it look like? We've talked functions. What about the forms? What are we looking for when we talk about literariness in a text? So there are two forms. One is extra patterning or parallelism or repetition. So things are made prominent visually in a text when they are in some way repeated. Okay, and some of you brought that up in your comments that you see it because, oh, this has been done several times in the short text. So what does that mean? And the second is a much broader category. It's called deviation. So subverting rules, conventions, expectations. That covers a broad range of potential ways of, of making meaning. And again, terminology is not something that we want to get bogged down by. In, in literary studies, there's more of a concern with the, the specificity of the terminology that you use. And we're going to introduce a terminology that is much more user friendly for our purposes uh, as we go along with this. But in some cases, there is no term. So it's going to be up to, <laughs> up to you to find a way to capture. You're going to see these things in a text. How are you then going to work with it? So let's look at an example. This is uh, the first line of a poem, the title Dollar by Rothka, and I'm not sure of the pronunciation. Huh? Rutka, he, I, I'm assuming he, yeah, OK. So um, this is the line. I have known the inexorable sadness of pencils. There are four instances of foregrounding in this single line. So I'd like you again to take a moment, with the people at, at your table, and just see what do you come up with. Think about extra patterning. Think about deviation. What do you see in this line? So, oops, sorry. We don't need to do it by table, but maybe if someone wants to volunteer to, to say one of the areas, uh, what, what do you see that's foregrounded in this text? Yeah. Do you want? Yeah. <laughs> and of course, there are no wrong answers, right? It's just this is what interpretation is. Yeah. I shouldn't, I shouldn't say it that way. There can be wrong answers. No. Well, what I've noticed is ascribing human attributes to animate to inanimate objects. Right. Yeah. Right. So personification. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We have a pretty, um, I think, obvious uh, deviation from lexical norms, and that inexorable is not part of everyday vocabulary. I think for almost any native speaker. Right. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, actually, I'll just show you the no. next slide. These are the, the deviations, right? And, and again, there can be others that you come up with. Yeah. Actually, yeah. I had one point yes. about uh, this poem reminds me of the works of Ezra Pound, mm. the one who just changed the mod of the poetry, just writing, kind of writing poems in forms of stanzas or kind of lines. He just changed it in one line poem, yeah. He has the metro station. That one's kind of maybe imitating, imitating that style, yeah. Right. So right. subverting the rules or conventions of writing poetry. Yes. It's quite noticeable. Exactly. Because poetry in and of itself, of course, is, is inherently <laughs> uh, literary, poetic, et cetera, right? Playing with conventions. But then you also then, within that, within those conventions, you, yeah. within the genre conventions, you can have poems that play against poetry, yeah. expectations for poems. OK, so this, in terms of deviations, this is tying into now what you've been talking about. So one is the use of have known. So have known already emphasizes experience. So we're looking for things foregrounding. What foregrounds? What stands out from the text, right? So we can think about either, again, extra patterning or deviation. These are deviations, have known. What does that mean? The second one, the sadness of pencils, ties in with the personification that you were talking about, but also in the generic plural. So for example, I can imagine if here is a group of pencils that's chewed up, the paint is chipped off, and they're broken, I can say, oh, that's a sad group of pencils. But to say, to talk about the sadness of pencils, it's not only personification, it's the generic plural. It means all pencils are, there's a sadness to, to pencils. <laughs> So, and then inexorable, right? So not only in terms of, I mean, it stands out because it's perhaps a different register. It's perhaps more, it's just odd. And also the meaning of the word, impossible to stop or prevent. Why is it impossible to stop or prevent the sadness of pencils, right? So in this one line, we already have these cues, these deviations. And then in terms of uh, 
repetition or extra patterning. And I heard, uh, I think you were talking about this in your, in your group. But anyway, so the, the, the extra patterning of the phonemes. Mm, and and uh, So I have known the inexorable sadness of pencils. I have known the inexorable sadness of pencils, right? So there's something going on about that patterning. And in fact, a lot of um, people, let's say, who are not involved in, 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 in um, literary studies, whether uh, informally or formally, often will think that in, in, a, in a poem that sounds are there for aesthetic pleasure. But when we talk about sound play, it also brings in meaning. And in this case, this poem is actually about working in a, a white collar office in the 1940s. It was written in the 1940s and the oppressive nature of that work. So throughout the poem, this theme of the dolorous uh, uh, nature of this stultifying uh, uh, nature of the work is foregrounded by this personification of all the office object, the objects in the office, and this droning kind of underlying sound of extra patterning of consonants and, and, and vowel sounds. So. Um, and poetry, of course, is so wonderful. A lot of the examples that we're giving you today uh, come from poems because they're just they're so succinct in their use of the literary. But uh, uh, we'll see that, of course, this is just true of language um, in general. So OK, we've been talking about, whoops, before I get to this, actually, I'll say, we've been talking now about foregrounding. And for all forms of foregrounding, regardless of what it is and what we call it, are all examples of intentional play with meaning making. But there is another dimension of what we call, what we bring under this umbrella of the literary for the flight approach, which is unintentional. And this ties back to the notion of languaculture and then rich points. Rich points are what happen between two languacultures. So again, going back to Agar, he says it's a verbal or nonverbal expression of a group or culture that does not make sense to the researcher, right? This comes from. Uh, uh, and, uh, linguistic anthropology. So, so a researcher goes into a new context and it says, de it describes what happens to a person who enters a novel linguistic or cultural context and encounters something that is puzzling, a term, action, style of discourse or conversation which differs from the frame that the researcher brings to the situation. So why is that under this category of the literary? Well, it's because that the literal meaning in the language culture, the first language culture, doesn't match the literal meaning in the second language culture, and therefore it, it evokes the need for what, again, Agar calls cultural translation. And this can be achieved in, in different ways, but the two most uh, obvious ways are to do it either through having uh, an insider I I inform you <laughs> as to the meaning of this thing, who, someone who understands both cultural perspectives, perhaps, or through research, anthropological research, and you have to do sort of deep uh, 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 listening and deep study in order to get at that, uh, that confrontation of two cultural uh, constructs. But the thing is that we're not talking about anthropology per se here. We're not going out and uh, researching in the same way. We're working with students who are studying another language. So we want, and students get very frustrated with this bumping up against cultural constructs that they, they don't understand and they can't even see. And sometimes that frustration they don't even feel the frustration because they don't even realize that they've just, you know, bumped right into it and they're oblivious to it, right? But it can be very frustrating, especially in, in uh, study abroad programs. And for all of you, and some of you who are here right now coming from other cultures, you're experiencing it all the time. And so part of the goal of the flight approach is to help people to better negotiate these by dealing with, in fact, rich points in the same way that we would uh, with foregrounding in terms of meaning making. So here's an example. Yeah. Can I ask yes, you please. Mess up the mic, so if I talk. Whoops. No. Uh, where is the mic? Up. So I'll I go just back. Have one little thing to yes, say, please. Because I think it's. I love the way that's framed. No, I was just going to add one of the things about the about literature and the literary is it often brings out these rich points by making us sort of strangers in our own land, yes. sort of defamiliarizing. Yes. And so in some ways, this exactly is why the literary is so well suited to the foreign language classroom and foreign culture classroom is because they're, they're sort of paired aptly because the students are being positioned in that defamiliarizing way 
in the L2 uh, in the same way that literary text will often position all of us as readers to sort of see something different in a very everyday kind of encounter and everyday kind of conversation. That's right. Um, so that I think often language learners are more literary than your average reader rather than less literary in some ways. Yes, but they don't, they don't believe it or they don't, they don't make that connection and so they don't feel emboldened to, to in fact uh, explore that dimension more, more uh, richly. So um, let's look at an example. Let's make this less abstract. And I'm going to give you a moment to read this to, yourself, to, to yourselves and then we'll go on. Okay, so what are your reactions? Um, one of my react. This is not all right. I, got, I have too many microphones here. <laughs> <laughs> I guess here. I um, think about rich point as always triggering an emotion. Um, because there's a lack of comprehension. You have an expectation for how things are going and it's not met. And earlier, in my little welcome, I was saying, oh, when people don't have, their expectations are unmet, they often get a little grouchy or grumpy or freaked out or whatever. So I think their rich points are often, you, be, you become aware of a rich point when you're feeling something. Um, and in the cultural context, it's like you're feeling that uh, it's often hard to put into words. Um, you're out of sync. Something that should be happening is not happening and you don't know why. And this particular example, I remember reading that and thinking about my own rich point happened in a wedding in India. And it was my daughter who married into an Indian family and we were all there. And I knew enough about uh, weddings in India that they're very big productions and you invite everybody. And so parts of it I was kind of prepared for and other parts I was not. And I remember the, the night before the wedding ceremony, we were having a big dinner with all the families. And you know, they say everything's bigger in Texas. It's not true. <laughs> everything's bigger in India. It was mind blowing. And I was feeling really anxious because I didn't know what was gonna happen the next day. And I was talking, I was sitting at a family they were all Indian, and I said, you know, I mentioned the, the, the rehearsal dinner. This is a nice rehearsal dinner. And they said, what? What is the re what? And I said, this is the rehearsal dinner, right? And they said, what do you rehearse? <laughs> and I said, well, the wedding, right? We're rehearsing the wedding. Why didn't we rehearse the wedding? When are we going to rehearse the wedding? I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And I could tell, this is a rich point, and he's, yeah, yeah. the person next to me said, well, you rehearse a wedding, but it's a ceremony. I said, I know it's a ceremony. We rehearse it in the United States. And he said, no, 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 no. You just show up. And th thinking about affect, I was so nervous because I had been thinking, what is my performance? I'm supposed to perform here? He said, no, 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 you don't have to perform. And I immediately felt, oh, cool. <laughs> I don't have to do anything but show up at the wedding. And it was true. There were thousands of it felt like thousands thousands of people there and people just said you come here sit down it happened it just but it was a very different way of doing a wedding than what I was used for and right. the, my emotions were kind of out of control right so we will be talking about emotions uh, a little bit later and actually how we channel them constructively but 
Um, when we talk about literacy, right, and text, <coughs> the next question is, what are the consequences of not being able to work transculturally and translingually? And so this is for, from a study that Swaffer and Ahrens uh, cited in, in their book from 2006 on remapping the foreign language curriculum. And so they go on and they say, one would presume that after reading additional text about American wedding practices, the Indian readers would find their earlier inferences inadequate or inappropriate. However, subsequent research on foreign language reading suggests that students resist correction of first impressions, that initial misapprehensions about textual features can become entrenched misreadings. And I'm sure, I mean, I know that I've experienced this with students, and, and, and maybe you have too, is that there's all this evidence in the text that seems obvious to you. And it's not just about one word, right? There's, it's always all this other stuff that's going on around it. But if they ascribe a particular meaning, that meaning that is resonant in the, in, in, in the native language, right, um, uh, to, to that, it's going to skew everything else. And they come up with an interpretation that either has little resemblance to what's really going on or ha is off in some key ways. So this is really the crux of the matter. So that as language teachers, we need to find ways. There's no you know, solution that's going to, to thwart all of these kinds of you know, cultural uh, uh, misunderstandings and, and, and misinterpretations. But we need to find a way to work more systemically with helping students to notice and better cope with these, these very issues. So now we've talked about the literary. So very quickly, the everyday. Um, it has to do with texts and context. Everyday text, everyday context. And text, of course, in talking about the flight approach, we're using text as, as in multiliteracy uh, frameworks more broadly. They're, they are oral, written, visual, anything that is a kind of coherent unit of communication, uh, spoken, et cetera, is a text. So we have different areas of text that we can think about. One is everyday genres. Can you think of examples? What are everyday genres? Text messaging. Text messaging. Conversation. Conversation. Uh, Emails. To do I was going to say letters, but of course, no one writes letters anymore. There, if, if at best, it's an email. Yeah. Uh, to do lists. To do lists. Yeah. Shopping lists, uh, street signs, billboards, etc. So, everyday genres, literary genres about the everyday. So the, they can be poems, they can be uh, 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 excerpts from novels, or uh, you know, every, literary genres of any kind, but about the everyday. And then also literary references and artifacts, artifacts that are recontextualized in personal genres. So for example, fan fiction or the linguistic landscape, landscape when you talk about street signs, right? So sometimes people will tag on a street sign or, 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 or on some other public space. They'll add something to it, right? And so suddenly that becomes, that's another layer of meaning that's brought in that can then potentially be explored um, for uh, meaning making if it's patterning out in a way that will be fruitful for language acquisition. So um, this leads to the question of what is an authentic text? So standard definition, it's a text produced by a native user for a nat native user audience. Is that, I don't know, is that, was that, would that be your definition, how you conceive that definition, how it's used more broadly? An authentic text? Corey, no? No, I mean, the, um, I take issue with the word native here. Okay, yeah. well, I, I said native user, but yeah, okay. I, I'm not, I don't mean actually, not potentially your interpretation, but the way that it's used in um, communicative language teaching textbooks oh, or standard. The standard definition. Yes, that's the standard definition within that, that context, which is what I'm getting at. Yes, <laughs> yes standard definition. <laughs> right, it's sorry. Deviating from a norm. <laughs> OK, so for flight, we have a very different definition. It's a text that plays literary dimensions of meanings off literal norms and conventions in order to heighten, nuance, or bring coherence to a text. That's our definition, basically, um, which is not to say that literal texts, again, the literary contrast with literal, 
It's not to say that literal texts can't be authentic based on the standard criteria, but they're just not the pedagogical focus of flight lessons. A flight lesson centers on, necessarily centers on, a text that has these literary dimensions that somehow play off of norms and conventions. So um, one of the, the things that really strikes me when I look at the standard definition is that it's quite exclusionary. It means that language students and teachers cannot produce authentic text if it's for the purposes of language learning. And that, it just seems to me problematic, to say the least, right? So the goal in, 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 in reframing the notion of what an authentic text mean, means is, let's identify what is authentic about communication. And then we use that, in a sense, because language is inherently semiotic. And so right, how do we deal with all of that noise that goes on in language that's not the prototypical or literal meanings. So I like to use a musical metaphor. So the literary constitutes the harmony to the melody that literal meanings lay down. And together, they create a fully realized uh, a unit and unity of communication. So when you think about this, think about uh, a student of music. Um, do they only, year after year, study the techniques that, that, uh, uh, um, uh, that apply to um, the, 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 the melody of a, of, a, of a piece of music. What about the harmonies, <laughs> right? If you want to create music, you need to also be sensitized to that. So the notion of, langua, uh, of musicality, you want students to, to develop a sense of musicality along with their techniques. So I coined the term languicality to make that parallel with language. We want to promote languicality along with languaging. So now you've got a little bit more of a concrete sense of where we're going with the literary. We're going to go back to the text that you have, conversation number one, and we're going to take, take a look at, um, oh, actually, two tools. I'm sorry. Uh, Devin, the handouts. <laughs> the handouts, please. <laughs> So we're going to give you um, two handouts. One is um, preparatory steps. So this is a handout. There are three steps that you're going to be following. Um, all of this work, remember, is conceptualizing all of the, the pre-work before you can actually then get to uh, scaffolding uh, um, the, 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 the meaning from, of a text in a, in a lesson. So you've got these preparatory steps. And then you also have a chart. And we're going to be taking a look at a chart, at the chart now. And in the session on application, you're going to be using these handouts um, for the text, one of the texts that you brought in. And this afternoon again. And this afternoon again, don't exactly. So don't, yeah, hold on to these preciously. <laughs> they will, of course, be available in the website as well later on, right, though, electronically. Actually, yeah, I'll take one too, just so. <laughs> so looking at the, yes, thanks. Looking at the um, chart, we're calling this layers of meaning um, for textual analysis. And you'll see on the left hand, uh, in the left hand column, the term metafunctions. This may also be a new term for you. So here's where, where we're getting into some of this terminology, right? So metafunctions uh, is a term that was coined by um, Halliday, Michael Halliday, the uh, uh, British uh, linguist. And if you look on your handout, Give a little bit of background information on that. Let me see where I have that. Yes, if you turn your sheet over to the second side, step number two for generating a textual analysis. Um, so this, is, this reflects Michael Halliday's work in systemic functional linguistics. So that's that first paragraph. Metafunctions were conceived to identify the three most basic functions that languages have evolved to serve for the purposes of communication. So the three key terms here are textual, interpersonal, and ideational. And you'll notice on the chart that we have, along with textual, textual we have a slash for compositional. And then under ideational, we have a slash with representational. These are terms that then come from uh, Frank Serafina's work that expands metafunctions to include these, these dimensions for visual texts, right? Because we really want this to be very holistic texts of all sorts. So 
when you do your work a little later with applying and, and also later with, with Chantel, you can go through what, what it involves and the questions that it poses. But if you then shift over for a moment to the flight categories of literary play, here is the core, these are the core terms that we, that we use um, for developing flight lessons. And there are several reasons why we've introduced these terms. Um, and I also uh, itemize that on the, on the handout. So it says on the first side, working with these terms can help um, situate the text in your curriculum, how it, it might fit the linguistic, thematic, and or cultural topics of a unit or chapter. It also provides language teachers and students with a way of talking about the literary, and then it will facilitate a textual analysis, which is what we're working toward. So you'll see uh, under flight categories of literary play, really basic, so syntax play, and this can go from sentential to textual levels. It has to do with the organization of a text, the coherence, so parallelisms, oppositions, digression, digressions. Visual play, and in this sense, it's about formatting, capitalization, punctuation, fonts, et cetera. Sound play, if it's, if it's an oral text, uh, which can include things like rhyming and homophones and alliteration. All of that relates to the textual level. But then when we get to the interpersonal level, right, how the interactants uh, are, are, what is their relationships to each other and what are their purposes? Um, how does the, the, the text make you feel? Do you feel addressed? By whom? What relationships are expressed in the text? Is there a valuative language, et cetera? We have two basic categories, pragmatic play. You can play with register, polite forms, forms of address. Perspective play, characterization, mood, evaluation, irony. These are only examples, right? They're, once you start getting into these um, categories of literary play, you'll see that they can be instantiated in such a wide variety of ways. But you want to at least lock it down in some sense. You have to, you have to give it a name, right? And then, so uh, on the ideational level or representational level, we have grammar play. So non-standard grammar or creative uses of grammatical metaphor. Word play, of course, puns and polysemy. Symbolic play, here we get into metaphors, metonymy. These are the more um, uh, uh, obvious, let's say, associations with play that a lot of students have. They think of it as metaphor. Oh, yeah, OK, we get metaphor. They don't really understand that there are all these other ways of playing. Um, figures of speech, allegory, and also visual sim symbolism when we start talking about uh, visual texts. Narrative play, so non-standard or subversive use of familiar storylines text worlds, narrative tropes, counter narratives, and culture play. So foregrounded schemes for cultural products and practices, code switching, code play. And then finally, a little bit outside of those three uh, levels, we have genre play, because genre play is a blending of two different kinds of, uh, one or uh, two or more actually, different kinds of uh, expectations, sets of expectations that we would have for a genre. So you have examples like modern fairy tales or theatrical performances of tweets. So you have these layers of meaning that you're going to be working with in order to develop a kind of textual analysis. And what's important again about the terminology is that these are terms that language teachers, if they haven't studied, uh, done literary studies, like myself, for example, I've never really done literary studies, but uh, I, I plugged in on a more intuitive level. So my hope is that these terms are speak to you intuitively and speak to students more intuitively. And by attaching the word play, it foregrounds the notion of literariness, right? So this is all you know all of these kinds of things in some fashion, but up, oh, let's flip it and let's bring in the notion of play. Okay, so. That I, was, I, you know, yes. it's funny you say that. I thought the word play, my association is it's mm. supposed to be fun. <laughs> it is. I mean, and, and um, <laughs> which is not what many people associate literary studies to be. It's right. not necessarily fun right. because the whole idea of textual analysis gets very heavy. Right. And so this idea of uh, we're really just talking about creativity, mm. but in a different way. So yes. I think that it helps me reframe textual analysis as just playing around with the text. Right. And that right. that is that helps that helps me get into this the mood of doing this actually. Right. Because I think um, well I don't know. I've met many language teachers who uh, and and many students who if you start to talk about the literary and literature and literary text, 
don't feel invited into that space to, they don't feel comfortable, right? So, so the notion of play is, is, is also a way of, of breaking down what it is uh, uh, that, that we, we want to do, making it accessible, yeah. Can I just add to that? Because I think one of the things that, um, that we're trying to do with these metafunctions that we'll also be coming back to later is to point out that play can be very serious. Um, that doesn't mean it's unfun necessarily, right. but when we're playing with our uh, frames of the world or our expectations about how people should behave, what they should do, that can get very serious yes. really fast. Um, yes. and so that's to move us away a little bit from another expectation um, that language play is about looking at just kind of rhyme or uh, children's texts or tongue twisters and things like that. But we can also look at the ways in which people play with relationships between individuals or views of the world um, through these texts and kind of expand their understanding of the language culture in that way. Exactly. Yeah. So, okay. Let's now look back at the, the text that we have, conversation number one. And I'm going to show you um, my textual analysis for it. Um, and I, the, the caveat here is that, of course, there is no one way, right, to, to interpret a text. There's no one way to develop a textual analysis. These are the things that stood out for me. This is the way um, I'm used to working in this vein in, 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 in my way. But the notion of OER is that it's open now to you to, to share, to do what you uh, uh, feel and what you can bring to it and make it your own, right? So. Back to the sample text. The question, first question I have for you is what genre is this? This was already something that came up. Some of you said a poem. What, 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 can, what can we call this as far as a genre? Text messaging, text messaging genre. It calls itself a conversation. Yeah, it's yeah. It calls yeah. itself a conversation. But it's, a con <laughs> but it's a dialogue conducted over instant messenger, so it's a conversation. OK, a dialogue, OK. But some of you say a poem. Why a poem? It's the right shape. It's what? Yeah. It's the right shape. It's the <laughs> well, I mean, that's, seriously that's the visual. That, OK, so that's a level of meaning. It's the visual. What do we see when we look at this text? So you see a poem. Yeah. OK. So in fact. The genre is called dialogue poem. It's a po and this is a po this is a, a, a sub genre of poetry that date, dates back to antiquity, and it's a poem composed by a com um, of a conversation between two fictitious speakers, each of whom expresses a different viewpoint. And typically, I mean, if you look on, on the internet or whatever for for views of uh, dialogue or, or conversation, sometimes it's called the conversation poem. Is that often the for each stanza, the stanza will be a different person speaking. They'll include the name of the person. So, they'll, so you'll be able to go back and forth and see, oh, this person, person A says this, person B says this. They'll use maybe uh, um, uh, bullets or hyphens or columns. Person A is speaking here, person B is speaking here. I've seen things, really interesting things done with collages and drawings and bubbles and it can go in all kinds of directions, right? But the, the basic notion of a dialogue poem is that it's a conversation between two fictitious speakers, each of whom expresses a different viewpoint. So here is a convention. And, and so here's the interesting thing. When I was looking for a text for this, I was trying to find, hey, what's a text in English that's going to really work for these purposes, da, da, da. And I wanted to contrast what is the, the dominant uh, genre that's used in Introductory level textbooks for language teaching, dialogues. <laughs> and I wanted to find a dialogue that was going to do exactly what I wanted it to do instead of the standard literal dialogue. So I happened to come across this poem. And I said, oh, I don't even know what the conventions are of a, <laughs> of a dialogue poem. So I went online and I found the conventions. And that's the uh, link that's included in, in um, in these slides when I talk about the convention. So here the first convention is voice. This is how your speakers speak. So it's their word choices, rhythms, and structures. And here is the convention for someone. This is to teach you how to write a, a dialogue poem. It says, the voice of each of your speakers should be distinct enough that a good reader could tell them apart without needing to be told which speaker is speaking. Now we already heard from, the, from your early uh, interpretations of this that you can't really know who is speaking. 
So we have two, when I'm talking now on the textual level, so this first column, we have textual level. Now I'm going to go into the two kind of areas of literary play that I see in it. So genre play, it is a kind of a blending, right? It's a dialogue po poem, but in the form of an exchange of instant messages. And then we have visual play. So the line spacing indicates turn taking, but because this is texting, we don't know who wrote the last line. The you first. <laughs> Whose voice is it? We don't know. On the now ideational level, we have some word play, and I've put this in red. So we see the word, the number first at the, in the very title, and we see at the, uh, as brackets basically for, the, for this poem, the word first at the end. So for me, this foregrounds ambiguity, because the use of number one in the title implies that more conversations on the topic will or, or should follow. But when we look at the last line, you first, we can't know if this will be the case. Now on the interpersonal level, there's a lot going on in this. So I'm going to talk about it first as pragmatic play and grammar play. So it's gra gr uh, pragmatic play that's kind of instantiated via grammar play. But someone brought up responding to a question with another question or a conditional. In first year textbooks, when you study information questions, you pose that question and you respond with yes, no, or maybe, or something to that effect. But what does it mean within, especially within here we get into repetition too, within the, within the um, space of a short dialogue, that so many questions are answered by either another question or a conditional. What does that mean? Going further with this pragmatic play and grammar play, we have oppositions. You've got double negatives that imply possible positive responses. I don't want to hurt you. That isn't the same as loving me. No, it isn't, is it? No. Right? Double negatives that raise that question of, is there possibly something positive going on here? Because that's what double negatives do in English. You also have the statement form for is it, as opposed to the standard question form. So there's, it's more declarative instead of questioning, which becomes ambiguous. We have register. Some of you brought up the, the idea of its complete sentences as opposed to texting abbreviations. And then also we have the use of shall, which is a formal invitation. So what is the register in this, in this dialogue or conversation? Going back to convention, we have what's called viewpoint. And this uh, site says that the advantage of a dialogue poem over a single speaker poem is that you can actually express and explore different viewpoints. So what do you do if you want to write one of these poems? You choose two speakers who hold different perspectives. And whether you find yourself agreeing with one perspective or, or, or the other, you should present each of your speaker's viewpoints accurately. But what happens here? We can't tell if the viewpoints are different, and it leaves the leader, le reader to wonder, and some of you brought this up, who are the speakers? Their age, gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomic class. Where are they? Why would they choose to have this conversation via text messaging? We don't have a sense of context, and, and I thought your, your comment was really interesting. If it had been a screenshot of an actual text messaging, we would interpret it differently than we're seeing it written on, on a page, et cetera, et cetera. We, it's decontextualized. It's outside of time. Even you brought up that the language could be something from different periods of time. It's not anchored um, to, to one moment in, or historical era. The convention of conflict. So coming together of two different perspectives often generates conflict. That's part of a poem that you want to bring up, right? Just, like, just as you would in, a, in, in, in um, the constructing of, of a narrative, right? You want to bring in some kind of a conflict, which of course then should ultimately be resolved or somehow constructively for both the, re for the reader, if not the speaker. So it's okay to have your speakers end in conflict, but somehow the reader should feel that there's been some sort of revolution, uh, resolution of that tension. But of course, there is no constructive coming together of perspectives. The conflict is not resolved because we can't know if the speakers actually differ in their perspective. So we are left with a lot of data. And notice that I really tried to tie this into the language in terms of the, uh, the language uh, uh, uses and functions that would be standardly recognized. And now we sort of flip it around and say, yes, but via foregrounding, we can see that some deviation in extra patterning, that something is going on here. 
So the question, how do we then tie all of this together? So we want to say, for this textual, ideational, and in interpersonal levels, how do these metafunctions and categories of literary play come together to convey a dominant theme? How do we put, it's all at the service of what the author is trying to communicate. So anyone want to venture a way to put this together? What is this poem about? What's the theme of this poem? So I guess it's dominant theme sounds a little imposing, but maybe just what is, the, what is this poem about, <laughs> right? What is, <laughs> what is the main kind of, how do these things tie together, right? So anyway, it, it's fine, just for the sake of time, let's, yeah. One, what one-sided love could be, right? I was thinking the buildup of a declaration of love. Are, are we serious? The buildup of a declaration of love. It, it, and it's got all this flirtatious language here, and you know, there's just it's playful. Uh -huh. It's like flirting uh -huh. is. Uh huh. Right? Yeah. Well, here's another question: How would you feel <laughs> if you were communicating with someone that you? wanted to come to an, a an answer to that question, right. <laughs> would, you, would you interpret, would you feel that it was playful? Or would you might, no, I don't there's know. There's a lot of background here too. There's a lot of background right. that there's we just don't know. There's a history behind this relationship. That's right. I mean, why would you even bring hurting into this if it, That's right. right if, if you really wanted to express love to someone? That's right, yeah. I would say the, the uncertainty and the anxiety surrounding love. Okay, so right, so I came to a similar sense but what I said is this is poem, a poem about being gently or politely evasive or noncommittal when asked to declare love for the first time, right? So all of this hedging that's going on, all of this ways of they're not saying no. <laughs> they're saying I could. <laughs> um, and so it's, but it's done in, in a polite, so we have that formal register, the use of shall, the, the complete sentences, right? So they're being careful. Um, so it's not, it's not devastating news. There's hope. It's also not a good way to answer. So when a woman asking this question, she receives, I could, it's not satisfied. But it does seem like both parties are, are, say, are communicating that message. And again, because the last line, you first, we don't know who says that last line. It means that they're on the same page. They're at that same point of being fearful about declaring love this, for the first this time. This is a really great paraphrase, because when I read it, I said, yes, that's it. But it's, it loses all of, the, of course, the, the punch and the feeling of the emotion. So if that's the literal as opposed to the literary. Right. But what I'm trying to do here is to say, to bring it back to language teaching, right? So if you want to turn this into kind of functional uh, um, part of it, right, is functional, how, how, how can students work with this? And this leads to my next uh, point, which is that the first half, pretty much, or whatever, the first part of a flight lesson is all about how you scaffold the literary. How do you break it down for your students? I've done this. This is a textual analysis, but, but Chantelle is then going to work with you of how you transpose this into activities and, and ways of working for students that they can then get what you want them to get out of it. Um, initially, for helping them to interpret the text, make meaning out of the text. And then the second part is um, synthesizing some of that. You don't have to use all of the literariness in a text. You, you, you choose what it is that you want. And if you look at the handout, on the second side, after you've done your uh, literary, uh, your textual analysis. So, so the first, actually, wait, I'm sorry. Let me step back for a moment. Let's go to the first part. What is the first step is finding the literary. And here are a number of tools at your disposal. So tool A is note any instances of extra patterning or deviation, those foregrounded forms. Is there anything else striking or unusual about how the text is structured? Tool B, engage in critical feeling by taking note of any reactions. So surprise, confusion, annoyance, excitement, this gets down to those emotions that you experience while reading. What mood does the text create? What aspects of the text might have contributed to those feelings? Tool C, look for any cultural rich points, words, phrases, expressions that carry a heavy cultural load. Visualize the underlying cultural frames or schemes in the, in the first language culture and the second language culture. What would a reader or a viewer need to, to know to understand this text? What questions do you have about the cultural context of the text? 
Then I say, we say research norms and conventions where necessary. You, you'll have time to look at this when you actually do your applications. I'll just walk you through quickly. And number three there is when you've identified one or more dimensions of the literary, um, go to the chart. Now you want to start assigning terms so that you can work with this um, um, in a lesson. So then you do your textual analysis. And then we get to the third part, which is drafting a redesigning task. So I like when I create a flight lesson, I like to, to bookend. I like to do my literary, uh, my textual analysis. But I also like to then have a sense of where do I want to go with this in terms of students putting this into practice. It's one thing they need to interpret the text, but then they need to do something with it, right? So redesigning is a term that comes from multiliteracies, and, and Chantel will go over that with you. I'll just give you a sense of it, a heads up. So the idea here is decide which dimensions of the literary and the text would fit your objectives for a redesigning task in the intended unit or chapter of your course. Think of a new context or situation and a suitable genre in which your students could put these selected dimensions of literary play into meaningful effect. It doesn't have to be the same genre as the reading texts. These dimensions of the literary will constitute formal constraints for prompting creative problem solving in your students' compositions, whether they're written oral or visual. And this then can provide scalable criteria for assessment, because a lot of people, the term, at least in the United States, in, term, in language teaching, in recent years, the term creativity has become a very strong point. And sometimes I've seen, I've seen uh, um, rubrics that say creativity in them. But there's no basis for understanding how you're actually grading or scaling creativity. So here it's about their effective use of these dimensions of play that you want them to um, put into, into meaning. So that, that drafting of ideas is meant to be a starting point um, for your lesson. You have an idea of, OK, these are my raw materials. This is what I get from the text. This is kind of where I think I want to go with it. And then Chantel will help you to put that together. So when we come back from the, um, from the break, uh, is it break now? Is that what the idea? Yeah, when we come back from the break, you are going to choose one of the texts that you brought in. Try to choose the text that's going to be the most fruitful for you in, 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 in thinking about this work with, with the literary. And, um, and then in that second session, you're going to have the time to put together the preparatory steps. Okay? You're going to create those raw materials that you'll then later on turn into a lesson. So the idea is for you to take the, the handouts uh, that we provided and to find the literary in the text that you're working with, the literary dimensions, put it together in some form of textual analysis. And again, this is a rough draft, but the goal at the end of this at by 12, is that what it is, until 12.30? Um, at 12.30, that you will have a draft of all of these preparatory steps, how you categorize the literary dimensions that you found in relationship to the, the meta functions. And you can use, again, this is a rough draft, so it can be, um, you know, you can draw lines, you can do it visually, you can uh, put it together in some kind of, um, more table fashion if that works for you, or it can just be an annotated text, anything uh, that works, but that's going to somehow allow you to put together these dimensions and to come to some kind of conclusion as far as what are the dominant theme, themes in this text and how, how, do, how are these things bringing that into, so into view. Know, you know, um, so this and we didn't really it. talk about the, the final step, which is the redesigning task. But again, maybe just make some notes. Think about, hmm, OK. Here's this text that, uh, that affords these different kind of literary dimensions. What can I do with that? Which dimensions would I want to choose to, to then create? And again, Chantel is going to work with you on that, to create some kind of writing. Think about redesigning as, in this case, writing, a writing task, or a task that involves some kind of creation of visuals. Um, what, it could be a different genre. It could be a different context. Um, but what can I get them to? do with this language that's going to help them uh, in terms of your curriculum, too. Because this is all about tying into your what you're already doing. It's not about trashing everything that you do. It's impossible and starting at zero and then being overwhelmed. No, this is about how can you tweak? How can you subvert? We like this word, subvert. <laughs> how can you subvert the textbook that you're already working with, but in ways that are going to really bring out what you want for your students?
Okay, so does everyone have a text? Okay, so go to and we can circulate to help you when you need or you can just do your thing. So here we have um, what, and the other point I want to make is that the meta language that you use, it's up to you to determine. Do you want to inter do you want to use a word like textual? Do you want to use, I mean, you want genre and theme? It's for you to decide with your students. I'm asking you to use that language in your textual analysis because it's going to make clear what it is that you're working with. Depends to what extent you want to go. Um, in using that with your students. So anyway, in terms of, here's an idea, genre and theme for, for this writing task, right? Imagine that you receive the following text message from your cousin and that it is also addressed to a third person. Hi A, hi B, I think you guys would really enjoy meeting up. You seem to share a lot of things in common. I'll let you text each other to see if you want to plan something. Hugs and kisses. So you and a partner will, will carry out a text message conversation to find out some basic things about each other and to see if you wish to meet. And I give an idea here of use of applications uh, like iFake text message or Google Story Builder. You are both hesitant to make contact with someone you don't know. Decide who will send the first message. Do not edit your messages once you have, quote unquote, sent them. Now this looks like already a fairly standard communicative language teaching writing task. But I'm going to go a step further, and here's where the literary comes in, perspective play and grammar play on the interpersonal level. When you feel it is appropriate, express polite non-commitment or evasiveness by either answering a question with another question or a conditional, and play with double negatives. So these are things that students are not asked to do normally, right? You, if, it's a, if it's an information question, if it's a yes, no question, as we said earlier, you, you say yes, no, maybe, right? But here I'm saying, oh, dig into your feelings a little bit. Depending on what your uh, partner is, is trying to get from you, they're trying to get information about who you are to see if they want to meet up with you, you want to have that ability to express a certain amount of hesitation, hedging, polite kind of non-commitment. So here you have these language forms. You've already learned uh, yes, no questions. If it's a second semester, you've already learned basic negations, patterns. Now you're learning conditionals. Put these together in playful form to help express this other dimension of meaning. So depending on how your communication unfolds and the degree of evasiveness that's expressed, you will see how you wish to end the conversation. Will you meet, agree to have a second conversation, or avoid making plans? Right? So open-ended. We don't know how that, <laughs> you, you won't know until it's unfolding how you want that to end. And then I've also added a symbolic play, uh, visual symbolic play for the ideational level. Choose a moment in your conversation that is important to you. Find an open licensed image to add that would heighten nuance or bring coherence to your message. Now, in regular text messaging, people use emojis to, you know, to do that, but that's literal. So what, now what I'm asking students to do, because I want to keep you know, su scaffolding and supporting um, these various ways of meaning making and getting them plugging into things that are a, st a step or two away from the literal. So find an image that is symbolic right, for you in the way that you're feeling or in that moment and include that. And that's going to mean that your partner is going to have to interpret that along with this other levels of evasiveness and sort of that's going to all come together in your communication um, to determine what the final result will be. So that's an example. So the point is that now you have the raw materials for creating a lesson, designing a flight lesson. So I like to, um, when I start and I generate my textual analysis, I like to have that other end goal of where do I think I want to go with it? What kind of activity task might I ask them to do for writing, visualizing, et cetera, whatever it is that I'm doing from, for that unit? Where might I want to go with this? And then when you develop the lesson, you may change. You know, this may evolve. It's not, it doesn't lock you into, but it gives you a goal, an orientation for going further. So that's where I wanted to end this session with. 
Uh, two minutes for questions or comments at, the, at this point. OK. So we'll break for lunch. We have until what time? 1.30. Until 1.30. We have an hour for lunch. And then when you come back, you're going to be working with Chantel for the next part of bringing Sorry, this into we'll focus.